Hi there, and welcome to another Views from the Valley, your weekly roundup of the news here in the United States, coming to you from the v3.co.uk offices in San Francisco. With me as ever, Sean Nichols. Hi, Sean. Hi, Ian. Right, OK, first off, uh, we've got some interesting news today. A zero-day flaw has been found in Microsoft's uh, virtual PC system. Uh, a flaw which the researchers say they contacted Microsoft about, but Microsoft had dubbed it not serious enough to actually patch and they'll uh, eventually get a fix coming out uh, a, little, a little later on. Basically, it's a flaw in memory management, which allows a hacker to inject code into a guest or virtual PC. I think Microsoft's attitude on this is, is kind of puzzling. I mean, if somebody shows you there's a problem in your system, it's, you should really be well, thinking about it. yes and no. Um, the nature of the flaw, I think, is something you need to know, whether or not it can be exploited through the web or if you actually have to have access to somebody's machine. Um, this is something that's kind of kind of a challenge to when we write the uh, Patch Tuesday stories because you say, okay, this can allow remote code execution, which is basically the way that people can put malware into your system. Yeah. Um, but not all remote code execution flaws are the same. It can, could be something that, yeah, you could compromise the system and install something on it through a web page or mm -hmm. maybe through an Excel file, which is going to be harder to you know dupe the person to opening. Or you have to actually be have physical access to their system either over the network connection or something like that which would make it really hard to, uh, to exploit. Well yeah, I mean we have had various cases like that where people have been able to guess passwords by looking at power level fluctuations within the actual data, within the actual processor and it's just like, yeah technically possible but unless you've actually got someone sitting there over your, over your, your PC actually trying to crack it it's not a tremendous amount of use but we'll keep an eye on it certainly and see if we get any exploit cloud in the wild. Now we've had rather good news regarding Zeus which you've been Covering this kind week. of good news, yeah. Um, an ISP in, I think it was Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. that, uh, was uh, taken offline, and it was uh, believed to be hosting something like a quarter of all activity using the Zeus uh, malware. Now, we say Zeus is a botnet, we don't mean it's not all a single botnet controlled by one person. No. No. It's a type of malware used to control several botnets, um, mm. and about a quarter of them were being hosted by this one company. Uh, it was it was Symantec and uh, Scan or uh, Symantec Cisco and Scansafe mm. were kind of talking, kind of provide comment on it, and uh, there are about five or six other security firms that are all kind of involved in this takedown. Um, unfortunately, this was fairly short lived, as I just got word from <laughs> Cisco that um, actually no, this botnet is or the uh, the operators have found a new host, and most of this activity is now once again picked up through another host in. Uh, I believe it was in Russia now. Yeah, I mean, we saw the same thing when the original Mercola takedown take happened. You know, you do get a slight drop off on activity, but the, the malware, uh, or bot farmers, as I believe they're now being called, have actually got a lot smarter. They've put in redundant control, command and control systems. So it's a bit like a game of whack-a-mole. I mean, you shut down one ISP, another one pops up posting exactly the same thing. But it's still a promising sign that they are actually It is out. promising, and, you know, some of the comments, some things I've heard was that this, yeah, this one incident may not be enough. But what it does is it keeps them, keeps them out, you know, the botnet farmers, whatever, having to move, having to go to new companies, mm -hmm. set up new systems, set up new hosts. So you got to pay more money, you know, pay for the storage. So it's, it's a time and a money issue where eventually if you can make it to where... It becomes it, so difficult to actually, or just yeah. so much of a fag to actually make the, th make the stuff then. Yeah, yeah, you might actually, you know, see a drop in activity. But, mm. I mean, yeah, in... in Short term, probably not a big deal. Hopefully it sets a good precedent, though, over the long term where you can kind of get more of these things offline. Yeah, and it's nice that the security industry is actually taking this tactic as well because it has a direct impact on the ISP so that if an ISP knows that they're hosting this, exactly. this kind of stuff, then they know they're going to go out of business sooner or yeah. later. Yeah, unfortunately in a lot of these areas, it's um, it can pay pretty well to uh, kind mm -hmm. of look the other way and not notice this. But hopefully, yeah, some of the bigger companies, some of the higher-ups will actually see this, the companies that are actually providing the smaller ISPs mm -hmm. with their search, with their, with their pipeline, they might actually start to crack down. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. And on takedowns of another nature, uh, this week I covered a, wiki, a, a leaked report uh, on WikiLeaks about apparently a U.S. Uh, Army plan to take down WikiLeaks or at least decredit the, uh, discredit the site. Now, you may be familiar with WikiLeaks. It's broken an awful lot of stories over the, over the years. Uh, and it's a very good way for people to publish information which normally wouldn't get out there. Uh, apparently, the U.S. Army plan was to uh, find and prosecute some of the leakers to not confidence in WikiLeaks rather than actually a physical takedown. Do you think this is the Army being too paranoid, or I mean, it's well, you got to understand this is the same group of people that built up an intelligence file on John Lennon. <laughs> yes. um, 
you know, I think it was, was it 10, 15 years ago when uh, the Clinton administration finally declassified all these surveillance activities from the uh, 60s and 70s. And it was some pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty far-fetched things. But, yeah, I mean, they kind of, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they're trying to uh, kind of discredit WikiLeaks. It's something that could be pretty damaging to, uh, you know, the careers and the images of a lot of these well, indeed. I mean, WikiLeaks has got enough problems as it is. I mean, it's just gone cut, beaten off some very uh, uh, determined legal action. It's chronically short of cash, uh, and yet it's desperately needed. I mean, sites like this and Crypto and others mm-hmm. are, are vital in terms of whistleblowing in particular, uh, with stories that the mainstream media just won't touch. Um, are we mainstream media? I think we... Mm, I, yeah, well, well, I, I mean, like to think part of it's also better. access as well. Yes, um, you know, WikiLeaks is something that's fiercely protective of who uploads. Everything can be uploaded completely anonymously. Um, and that's something that a news organization doesn't always have the resources or the ability or the interest to uh, to do. Yeah, I mean, it'll certainly set the tinfoil hat brigade going, oh, well, we, just like we always told you, but uh, we shall see how that goes. And if you are feeling um, particularly generous, pop onto the WikiLeaks site and donate them some cash. Yes. And right, so finally... <coughs> We've had uh, a story regarding uh, the smart regarding smartphones and the popularity of the uh, of the Nexus One. Uh, yeah, new, new study come out saying that over the first seventy four days mm-hmm. of availability, um, the Nexus One managed to sell something like one hundred thirty five thousand units. Um, fairly good, except I was that, say, it's not bad. <laughs> yeah, if they if they fancy themselves an iPhone killer um, mm-hmm. or a Droid killer or a serious competitor. Uh, not very good. Uh, over that same 74-day period, the iPhone hit 1 million units, sold mm-hmm. the original one back in 2007, and uh, this year when the Droid was released, in that same 74-day period, it was something like uh, 1.03 million, I think. Uh, 05, I think it was, 05, yeah. yeah. But still very impressive. It seems old, really, because, I mean, we actually saw the Nexus One the day it came out, uh, not, at, not at the actual launch down at Google headquarters, because we were catching a plane to go to CES. And while we were there, there was a bloke with a, a box that was saying Nexus One on it, playing with a phone. It was just like immediately, ah, right, okay, let's go and have a look. And I'd say it looked rather good. Um, the speech-to-text thing in particular looked very good. The only, and the only sort of niggle I've heard about it now is poor battery life, but you get that with pretty much every smartphone, as far as I can tell. So what do you think, what do you think is holding it back? Oh, I don't know. I mean, the, um, the, the report on this suggested that there was a lot, you know, the marketing was kind of misplaced mm-hmm. when you go to where it was. Um, and, you know, you got to consider that as, you know, as journalists, a lot of the early adopters, they'll generate a lot of buzz for something that doesn't always translate over into the larger market. I mean, just mm-hmm. because all the reporters and all the reviewers really like a phone doesn't mean everyone else is going to find it useful and want to purchase it or going to buy into, you know, some of the marketing, some of the pitch. Mm-hmm. I mean, Motorola pushed the droid very, very heavily through TV commercials, you know, to, to a larger audience rather than kind of go through... There's a huge switching. billboard on the, on the freeway out of the city, and yeah. plenty of them. Uh, and I've seen very little advertising for the Nexus One, very little point-of-sale stuff either. Um, yeah. But they've just signed up with AT&T, so hopefully that... Well, be- they've just adjusted their phone to work on AT&T. If you're actually... If you have an AT&T plan already, you can get it. You have to pay the $500 for the unlocked phone. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the unlocked iPhone is still like several several hundred dollars yeah. too, so it's not like they're it's not some outrageous price, but you have to pay the full price for it, and uh, then you know kind of put in your own SIM card and use your own plan from AT and T. Um, you know, so for some years, yeah, it's good. Previously, it wasn't compatible with the three G network, so while you mm-hmm. could technically use it with AT and T, you couldn't use a lot of the features. Um, right. Okay. So it's all likely crippled. Not great. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye on how sales of that go. Google I.O. is coming up later in the year, and we'll, I expect we'll be hearing a lot more about that and future versions of the Nexus phone there. But in the meantime, you can read more about these stories at www.v3.co.uk.